Hello, and welcome to the Critical Care Ultrasonography Curriculum. Uh, this first talk is an introduction and overview to the use of clinical ultrasonography in the critical care setting. Before we get into the, uh, the heart of the subject matter, I think it's important to define uh, the scope of what it is that we do as clinician sonographers in the critical care setting, and even more importantly, what it is that we do not do. Uh, because I think we need to know what our scope is in order to get good at that scope, to get good at that very specific uh, skill and technique set. Uh, and also to know what our scope is not uh, and know, to know when to ask for help. So what is critical care ultrasonography? Number one, it is a goal-directed modality. So you are going in as a clinician uh, with a specific clinical question in mind uh, in order to use the ultrasound to achieve a specific clinical goal. It is rapid. So you're not wanting to go into the room and spend half an hour, 40 minutes trying to do a thorough ultrasound exam. Again, you're going in with a specific clinical question and trying to use the ultrasound to help you answer that question and decide on intervention. It is clinical. So think of the ultrasound machine as an extender of your physical exam. So again, you as the clinician are going into the room to assess your patient using physical exam. And you're also using the ultrasound to help you get information on what is going on with the patient and help you make clinical decisions based on the context. I think the one thing that separates point of care ultrasound from diagnostic ultrasound is the idea of repeatability and the importance of repeatability. So how we should be using ultrasound in the clinical setting as a clinician is you go into the room, do your assessment, decide on intervention, do that intervention, and then come back an hour or two later with your ultrasound machine to get an idea of how well or how poorly the patient is responding or not responding to your chosen intervention and to decide whether to continue the course on that intervention or to change course and do something different. That concept of repeatability is something that definitely differentiates between uh, what we do and what the diagnostic ultrasound folks do. What we do not do as clinician ultrasonographers, we do not do comprehensive diagnostic modalities. We're not going in there to do a 16 point uh, formal echo. We're going in there to answer a specific clinical question. We're also going in there with a clinical context in mind. So you are not a technician. You are a clinician going into the room with the ultrasound machine to help you make a clinical decision, okay? And again, it's not time consuming. You should not be spending more than about, you know, 15, 20 minutes in the room uh, with the machine to get an idea of what it is you should be doing uh, for the patient. Uh, these are the modalities that I consider to be within the wheelhouse of critical care ultrasound. And these are all the, of the various modalities that we will cover uh, in, individually as we go forward. Uh, we will cover lung and pleural ultrasound, uh, basic and advanced cardiovascular ultrasound, uh, deep venous ultrasound. I will not be covering procedural ultrasound within this curriculum. Um, we will cover uh, the FAST exam, uh, renal ultrasound and bladder ultrasound, a little bit of bowel ultrasonography, uh, and then ocular ultrasound as well. So the things highlighted in red are the things that we will cover uh, in the next few weeks uh, with this curriculum. Now, like I said before, uh, usually the, the cornerstone of your ultrasound assessment, just like of any clinical assessment, is having a clinical question in mind and using the ultrasound to help you uh, answer that question uh, very specifically and in a very focused manner. So there's some of the more common questions that uh, I think ultrasound is very powerful in helping you answer. Uh, for example, why is the patient in shock? Why are they having difficulty breathing? Why are they not peeing? Uh, why are they altered? Uh, these are things that the ultrasound is very powerful in helping you answer and helping you decide on an intervention, a, a time-sensitive intervention very quickly. So we will cover these as we cover the various individual modalities within critical care ultrasound. Questions we don't answer. So again, we are not diagnostic sonographers. We're not trying to answer questions like, what is the EF? Is that a vegetation? How bad is the hydro? Uh, again, our questions are broad strokes uh, and very focused in, in, uh, in, in scope. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the nuts and bolts of uh, ultrasonography. Uh, I'm going to get very, very uh, briefly into some concepts of physics uh, and sound uh, mechanics, uh, but I'm going to try and keep it as practical uh, as possible. So first, let's talk about the actual um, hardware itself, specifically the, the ultrasound probe. So if you were to take the ultrasound probe and sort of cut it you know, down the middle and break it apart, uh, and look inside, 
This is sort of a representation of what you would see. Please do not do this with any of our probes. Um, but what you would see inside is a, a housing here, which contains sort of the core of the probe, which is the piezoelectric crystal. That crystal is connected to a couple of electrodes uh, that produce uh, an alternating current um, and is surrounded on three sides by a, uh, a hard shell. And then on the uh, front part, a sort of rubberized plastic uh, nose. So what happens is this crystal, as you may recall from high school physics, a piezoelectric crystal, uh, when applied uh, a current, will vibrate at a certain resonant frequency. Okay? That vibration will create ultrasonic waves. And those ultrasonic waves will then get shot out of the probe through that sort of rubberized plastic nose uh, and into the tissue, into the patient, into the tissue. And depending on the type of tissue that that sound encounters, it will do one of three things. It'll either get bounced back to the crystal. When the sound hits the crystal, the crystal vibrates. That vibration then creates an electrical current, which is sent back into the machine and interpreted. The sound is either reflected back or it's scattered or it's transmitted through, okay? So like I said, the sound that's reflected back hits the crystals, makes the crystals vibrate, which generates an electrical current. That electrical current is pushed back into the machine and then the fancy processor inside interprets the intensity and timing of the electrical current and generates an image based on those, those properties. Okay. So like I said, based on the property of the tissue that the sound encounters, it will do one of you know, three different things. Uh, if the sound encounters fluid, uh, as you know, fluid is a very efficient transmitter of sound. So what happens is when sound hits fluid, it goes right through. Uh, so if you ever look at a fluid containing structure on ultrasound, the fluid portion of that structure will appear black or anechoic um, on, on the machine because all the sound is getting transmitted through, almost none of it is getting bounced back until it hits the thing that's behind the fluid containing structure. Bone on the other hand, uh, reflects almost all of the sound back to the crystal. So if you were to look at bone on ultrasound, the cortex of the bone will appear very white or hyperechoic, and then there will be a shadow behind it. So bone will have a very thin hyperechoic line representing the cortex, and then a shadow uh, deep to that deep to that line, as, that, as no sound gets through. Soft tissue is sort of a combination of fluid density and uh, um, and sort of like connective tissue density. So depending on how dense that tissue is. Um, the soft tissue will do a combination of transmitting sound through and reflecting sound back. And depending on how much sound is reflected back, the image that's produced will be in varying shades of gray, depending on the density of the, of the tissue that you're, that you're imaging. And finally, if you're looking at air on ultrasound, uh, as evidenced by the fact that I can turn away from you and you can still hear my voice, uh, air is a very efficient uh, diffractor of sound or scattering medium of sound. So when the ultrasound machine, ultrasound wave, hits an air containing structure, all the sound scatters or diffracts, and that creates an artifact on the screen, okay? When we talk about lung ultrasound in the next talk, we'll talk about how to interpret those artifacts to get an idea of what's going on with the underlying tissue, okay? So again, fluid transmits sound, appears black or anechoic, bone reflects sound, and it appears white with a shadow deep to it. Soft tissue does a combination of transmission and reflection, so it's gonna be varying shades of gray on the screen and air causes sound to scatter, creating an artifact. Um, when you, if you were to sort of conceptualize what that sound wave would look like coming out of the ultrasound machine, it's gonna look, out of the ultrasound probe, it's gonna look something like this. It's gonna be very thin, uh, and it's gonna be sort of a, a slice coming out. And we'll sort of slice the tissue through like that, okay? I think it's important to, to conceptualize this because it will get you an idea of what uh, the image will do based on various uh, repositioning maneuvers that you'll make with the probe. And we'll talk about that as we, as we go forward. I wanna now talk about some of the uh, important uh, principles or properties in reference to imaging uh, that's uh, relevant to you as the clinician sonographer. The first thing, and I think one of the most important principles uh, when it comes to imaging is frequency. 
So the frequency refers to the frequency of the sound being transmitted out of the probe uh, and into the tissue. In general, the difference between high frequency sound imaging and low frequency sound imaging is that with a high frequency setting, uh, you are gonna get very good resolution, so very high resolution, but the overall penetration is gonna be poor. So a high frequency setting will give you the ability to look at a tissue structure that is very superficial in very high amounts of resolution. So for example, if you're trying to look at a nerve uh, or at an IJ, um, you'll be able to get really high resolution of a really superficial structure. But if you were to try to look at something much deeper like the aorta using a high frequency setting, because the penetration is gonna be poor, the imaging of deeper structures will be relatively poor. The, the opposite is true with a low frequency setting. A low frequency setting gets you good penetration but relatively poorer resolution when compared with a high frequency setting. So for example, with a low frequency setting, you can look at a deep structure like the aorta pretty well, but it wouldn't be really good to get a high resolution view of the IJ for cannulation. The second uh, sort of uh, imaging property is what's called your sampling rate. Now, like I talked about before, the crystal sort of uh, goes back and forth between being a transmitter of sound as it vibrates and creates sound and a receiver of sound. Um, and the rate at which the crystal or the machine switches the crystal back and forth between talking, transmitting, and listening, that is the sampling rate. So the faster it switches back and forth between transmitting and receiving, the higher the sampling rate, okay? So in general, the purpose of a high sampling rate will, is the ability to be able to look at fast moving objects with a high amount of fidelity. So for example, if you're trying to look at a valve, on a tachycardic heart, uh, having a setting which utilizes a higher sampling rate will give you the ability to look at that with a high degree of, of fidelity. You do sacrifice some penetration though with a high sampling rate, okay? So if we were to put this together, if you were to um, you know, take your machine and, and, and select a probe, uh, depending on the probe that is selected and depending on the software package that is installed in your machine, there's gonna be various imaging presets that are available to you um, with, with that probe, okay? So if you were to take the phased array probe, for example, uh, on our machines, uh, if you were to plug that in and hit your uh, exam features, uh, exam options button, you'll have a number of presets. Uh, so two of the presets that are available to you with the phased array probe is the abdominal preset and the cardiac preset. If you were to also look on the side of the phased array probe, you'll see that there's a frequency range on that probe. Uh, our phased array probes have a frequency range between one and five megahertz. So if you were to, for example, select the abdominal preset on the phased array probe, what the machine will do is it will shift the frequency range down closer to the one megahertz range and switch the sampling rate down as well. So what it'll be able to do, it'll be able to give you a uh, good penetration uh, imaging at, at a pretty good depth, um, but the ability to look at fast moving objects will be sacrificed a bit. So for example, the abdominal setting is really good to look at the aorta or to look at bowel. But if you were to try to look at a heart, especially a fast beating heart with the abdominal setting, it wouldn't look very clear, okay? The opposite is true with the cardiac setting. If you were to turn on the cardiac setting, what it will do is it will shift the frequency higher and shift up the sampling rate. So it gives you the ability to look at the heart, which is a relatively superficial structure that is moving relatively quickly with a high degree of resolution. But if you were to try to look at the abdominal aorta using the cardiac setting wouldn't look so good. Okay, so that's how frequency and sampling rate uh, will on the practical side uh, uh, modify your ability to uh, optimize uh, imaging of various structures. Uh, resolution is fairly self-explanatory. It's basically the uh, level of fidelity or the degree of detail of the actual tissue structure versus the image that's produced. And there's various types of resolution that are, that are uh, um, described spatial resolution, contrast resolution, and temporal resolution. I'm not gonna to get too much into that, uh, but we can uh, discuss that at a later time. And then finally, gain. So gain is the degree of amplification of the sound wave that's being received back into the machine. So this is a processor setting. Uh, so basically the higher the gain is set on the machine, the more the sound will be amplified and the brighter the image will be on the screen. Okay, so think of, uh, gain like the volume knob on your radio. So I don't know, you know, the age range of uh, the people who are, who are watching this video are, uh, but I don't know how many of you have had an analog tuned radio in your car, for example, growing up. 
So imagine that you're taking a long distance car ride, right? And uh, you leave one city and you're tuned into the uh, music station, the music station that you enjoy. And you, you hear a song that you like. As you're driving further away from the city, um, uh, you start to pick up a different station, let's say a news radio station, um, as you're driving away from the city and towards another. You really like the song that you were listening to, but now it's being interrupted by the, by the news radio. Um, so you're like, oh man, I really want to hear this song. So you turn up the volume. Is turning up the volume going to make this, the, the song come out more clear? No, it's going to make both the song and the news come out at a higher volume. If you want to make the song come out clearer, you have to tune your radio first, closer to that song, uh, the, the station that's playing that song in order to hear the sound. Then you can hear the song, then you can turn up your volume knob after that. It's similar to ultrasonography. So the mistake that I see a lot of novice sonographers make is that they'll put the probe down, say they're trying to get a personal long X, they'll put the probe down on the, on the heart and they'll see sort of a crappy image. And they'll think I need to make this better. So the first thing you do is they'll jack up the gain. It's not gonna work. It's just gonna make that crappy image brighter. It's not gonna make anything come out more clear. So what you need to do is you need to tune into your station first. So optimize your imaging first and then optimize your gain, okay? So I like to think of it that way. I think that's a good way of thinking of how to uh, practically use gain uh, to optimize your imaging. Tune into the station first and then, and then uh, change your gain to make things better. Okay, this concept of time gain compensation is just a fancy way of saying that you have the ability on machines to adjust the gain on different fields of your screen. So for example, on the, the Sonostat machines that we use, we have two fields. We have a near field and a far field that you can uh, uh, individually adjust the gain settings on. The near field is, is, is the top of the screen, the top half of the screen. The far field is the bottom half of the screen. Uh, so you can individually adjust the gain on the top half or on the bottom half. And there's also a total gain knob where you can adjust uh, the gain on the whole screen at the same time. Okay. So we'll go over that when we actually go and, uh, and look and play with the machine. Uh, it's important though uh, to remember back to gain that um, Largely gain is uh, uh, subjective in nature. So some people prefer a brighter image versus some people that prefer somewhat of a darker image, but there are some objective criteria on how to set gain. So in general, the way to set gain is that if you're looking at a fluid filled structure, you want the gain to be set low enough that the fluid filled structure is anechoic or totally black in appearance on the screen. But you want the gain to be high enough that you're able to differentiate the soft and connective tissue around that fluid filled structure clearly. So for example, if you're trying to image the IJ for cannulation, you want the gain set low enough <clears throat> that the lumen of that vein appears black. If the gain is set too high, that black lumen will, will appear whitish or grayish, okay? At the same time, you wanna set the gain high enough that you can see the wall of the vessel around the lumen uh, clearly. Okay, so that's gen sort of some general uh, guidelines on how to set gain. And finally, depth. So depth refers to, again, how deep you are imaging. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about the concept of depth and centering uh, when you're scanning. So the thing to remember about ultrasonography, especially the machines that we have, is that the highest resolution of imaging is gonna be of the object that's dead center on the screen. Okay, so dead center up and down, dead center left and right. So the highest resolution is dead center on the screen. So when you're uh, scanning, you wanna place the object of greatest interest in the center of the screen. And by center, I mean both left-right center and deep superficial center. The left-right centering is accomplished by sliding the probe along the axis. And the deep superficial centering is accomplished by adjusting your depth setting uh, on the machine. Okay, so remember, object of interest should be dead center on the screen. And when we talk about the individual ultrasonographic modalities, we'll talk about where to center your imaging based on what, you, what you're looking at. Okay. Uh, as far as the probes that are available to us as intensivists or critical care practitioners using ultrasonography, these are the most commonly used probes that we will, we will encounter. The phased array probe is sort of the, the workhorse of critical care and acute care. And we'll talk about why, but the long and sh the, the short of it is, <clears throat> that footprint of that probe is, is rather small and it helps you get in between ribs. The linear probe, of course, we will use for, um, for cannulation of vessels and also for DVT ultrasonography. 
Then finally, the curved linear probe. This is your uh, sort of a lower frequency probe, which gives you really good uh, penetration, really good depth of, of field of view. Uh, so if you're trying to look at uh, abdominal ultrasonography, this is a good probe view. Okay, but like I said, the bulk of what we do, especially on the diagnostic side, will be done using the phase array probe. I think all of you guys are familiar with orientation markers, but uh, I want to talk about that really quickly. Um, so the orientation markers are various markers on the probe and also on the screen, which helps you orient your image. Okay. So these are some examples of how various orientation markers are on different probes. Um, some of them will be dots. On some probes, you actually have a, a raised, you know, sort of line or ridge, which will act as the orientation marker. Uh, so sort of keep that in mind, knowing your 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 machine and uh, uh, what sort of indicator on the on the probe itself is the orientation marker. So the orientation marker really gives you two things. It tells you two things. One, it helps you orient your image in relation to the probe position. So it'll help you orient left and right, superior versus inferior, anterior versus posterior, um, and it all is correlating with where the uh, indicator on the probe is in reference to where it is on the patient and in reference to where the dot is on the screen, okay? So it tells you orientation and it also tells you the direction of the axis of your sonic slice, okay? It tells you long axis versus transverse versus oblique and it tells you, you know, sort of what direction the axis of your scan is um, in relation to the patient. And like I said, all these are correlated with the orientation marker that is on the screen itself. So for example, uh, this is a, uh, a probe being placed on the chest in order to get a peristernal long axis view. So the dot in this case is pointed to the patient's right shoulder. So that tells you two things. One, it tells you that whatever is on the patient right will correlate with whatever is on the side of the orientation marker on the probe. And it would also correlate with the side of the screen where the dot is on the, on the ultrasound machine screen itself. So for example, anything on patient right will be on the indicator side of the probe and on the indicator side of the, of the dot on the screen. And it also tells you the axis of imaging. So the axis is always gonna be parallel to uh, the location of that orientation marker. So the orientation marker is here, the axis of your scan is gonna be parallel to that axis of the probe. Okay. Um, different types of transducers will produce different sort of shapes of uh, fields. And it all depends on how the ultrasound crystals, the piezoelectric crystals are arranged in the uh, probe itself. So the linear probe or the linear array actually has crystals that are arranged in a linear fashion, sort of a parallel to that flat nose of that probe. And so when those crystals vibrate in response to an alternating current, the sound will be shot out sort of in this direction like this, and the slice will be sort of a square slice. So the field that is produced on the screen will be square or rectangular in shape, okay? And again, there is an orientation marker on the probe. So whatever is on that side of the patient, either up, down, left, right, will be on, in this case, the left side of the screen. So if you're doing a long axis image, the head where the dot is pointed to the patient's head, the head will be here, feet will be here, or superior, inferior. Or if your dot is pointed to the patient's right, this will be patient right, this will be patient left. The curvilinear probe has uh, their crystals arranged in a curvilinear fashion, again, parallel to the, the nose of that probe. So when those crystals vibrate, they send out sound in a sort of a windshield wiper path shaped field like this, which will produce an image that looks like that. Again, dot on the probe correlating with dot on the screen. And finally, the, like I said, the workhorse probe of critical care, I think is the sort of the most unique probe uh, that is in your armamentarium and that's the phased array probe. Um, so the phased array probe is special because instead of having crystals grouped, you know, sort of in a linear fashion along the nose, the, the group, the, the crystals are grouped tightly together at the center of the probe. 
And not only do the crystals vibrate and shoot out sound, but the entire array oscillates back and forth, again, parallel to uh, that probe there. So the crystals vibrate and the array itself oscillates back and forth. So what that does is it creates a field that is very narrow at its origin, but as the array oscillates, as you get further and further away, the, the deeper part of the field becomes very wide. So you get a, a sort of a cone-shaped uh, uh, field. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to scan in between things like ribs, where the origination point you know, is narrow, but still allows you to get a pretty wide field of view. So this is why this is a workhorse in critical care, because a lot of what we do is between the ribs. And again, orientation marker correlates with orientation marker on the screen. Okay, So this is the most unique probe, um, but also because it has moving additional moving parts, as opposed to the other probes, this is the first probe that generally breaks. So this is the most delicate of the, of the probes that we have. So it's the one that you need to take care of the most. Okay. Um, now onto the various modes that we'll use uh, at the bedside. Uh, the bulk of what we'll do will be in what's called B mode or your two-dimensional imaging mode. That's like your default imaging mode. Uh, then there's M mode. M mode is basically a way to look at the motion of a particular structure of interest over time. So it's sort of a slice through a slice. So you get your two-dimensional imaging and you put a line down through your field and uh, the M mode will actually allow you to track uh, the motion of whatever is on that line over time. The interesting thing about M mode is that the resolution in M mode is actually higher than the resolution in 2D imaging. Um, so oftentimes you can um, look at uh, moving objects in much higher resolution using M mode than in, than in 2D. Uh, then there's Doppler. So we'll be utilizing Doppler uh, uh, both on the basic uh, ultrasound modality side, but even that much more when we talk about some of the advanced applications, especially in advanced echo. Within Doppler, there's you know, sort of two categories. There is your color flow Doppler, which you can think of as sort of a qualitative mode of Doppler. It sort of tells you three things. One, it tells you, is there flow or not? So if there's color present, there is flow. It tells you in general, the magnitude of flow. So the more color there is, the more flow there is. And it also tells you direction of flow. So the way that most machine presets are, are uh, set, um, red color indicates flow towards the transducer. Blue color indicates flow away from the transducer. The way I remember that is the words red and towards both have a, an R and a D in it. I don't know, it helps me remember. And blue does not. <laughs> so red is towards, blue is away. And the other thing it tells you is, it tells you whether there is laminar flow or turbulent flow. And a lot of times this can help you clinically. So for example, if, a, if the flow that you're seeing is single color, that means it's laminar. So for example, if it's, if it's red, all the blood, for example, is going in one direction. If you turn on color, on the other hand, and see multicolored appearance, like a mosaic, you know, varying shades of green and yellow and orange and things like that, uh, then what it's telling you is that there's actually multidirectional or turbulent flow. So sometimes the ability to identify turbulent flow where there should be laminar flow can uh, give you a lot of information uh, clinically about the patient, okay? So color flow is your qualitative mode of Doppler. And then there's your quantitative modes, which in critical care, we use two modes, pulsed wave and continuous wave, which refer to the, the manner in which uh, sound waves are, are, are sent out of the probe. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about echo. So these are all the various modes that we will use uh, at the bedside in the critical care setting. Now, finally, I wanna talk a little bit about scanning terminology. Uh, sort of the unfortunate thing about uh, ultrasound is that um, given that there are a number of different specialties that practice both diagnostic ultrasound and point of care ultrasound, uh, each of those you know, various professions and various specialties have developed their own terminology uh, for scanning. And uh, the unfortunate thing, of course, is none of those terminology uh, systems really line up with each other. And even within specialties, uh, terminologies are not standardized. So there is a drive, at least within critical care ultrasound, to try and standardize terms. And some of the terms that are, stand, are trying to be standardized are some of these ones that are used for scanning. So I wanna talk about these five terms, which, um, uh, which I hope will become standardized soon, at least within critical care. 
We're going to talk about angling, tilting, rotating, sliding, and compressing. So first, I want to talk about angling. So angling is basically changing the angle of the probe uh, in reference to the patient. So angling, in this case, means changing the angle of the probe perpendicular to the axis of scanning. So for example, back to this personal long axis view, dot pointed to the patient's right shoulder. That means the axis of your image is like this. So angling the probe means changing the angle of the probe perpendicular to the axis. So for example, putting the probe down and changing the angle this way. You may have heard the term fanning. That is the same thing as angling. Okay, so um, that, is, uh, that, is, that is what angling means. Tilting is sort of the opposite. Instead of changing the angle perpendicular to the axis, you're changing it parallel to the axis. So you're changing the angle like that. So that is tilting parallel to the axis. You may have heard the term rocking. Uh, it's the same thing as tilting, but again, we want to be using the term tilt. And so when I teach you guys at the bedside, I'm going to be using these terms, angle, tilt. So hopefully I can uh, give you an idea of what I want you to do with the probe without actually having to touch the probe itself okay, when you're scanning. Rotation, fairly obvious. You're actually changing the angle or the direction of the axis itself. I think this is fairly standard no matter what uh, specialty you're in. Sliding is, again, just moving the probe on the patient's chest. I put this in here because this is also a good way of understanding how to move the probe. Uh, this becomes very important in, in, in echo and cardiac ultrasound. Uh, if you put the probe on the chest and you don't really like what you're seeing, what you don't want to do is lift the probe off and put it down on another spot. You actually want to look at the screen and slide the probe on the chest uh, to enable you to get the view that you want. Okay. And then finally, compression is when you exert an axially loaded force into the patient. Um, we use this a lot during DVT ultrasound. This is the cornerstone of DVT ultrasound, which is also called compression ultrasonography, where you look at the vessel and compress it. Okay, so those are the five standard terms, angle, tilt, rotate, uh, slide, and compress. If you have questions, come and find me. Uh, that's my email address, of course. Um, I look forward to getting out there with you and, uh, and scanning.